Let me ask that you would look in your Bibles at Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, because we're coordinating with the Klang Valley Bible Conference. You may know we're, we're moving through the book of Ephesians uh, in the morning and evening sessions. So last night we were in the opening verses, Paul's greeting to those at Ephesians, but now we begin to get into the body of his epistle. And uh, those of you who are very familiar with the book of Ephesians and other portions of the scripture, just a few pop quiz questions. You ready? What is the longest chapter in the Bible? Anyone? What's the longest chapter in the Bible? Psalm 119. What is the longest sentence in the Bible? Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. That's, we're about to look at it, right? The longest sentence in the Bible. Now, if it's the longest sentence in the Bible, you know there may be some significant things that are about to be said, right? And uh, if you just think a little bit, and if some of you were there last night, in the context of Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, this same Saul, who had been breathing out threats against the church, who had persecuted the way to death, that is, the followers of the way of Jesus. He had persecuted people to death, including holding the coats of Stephen, holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen. You recognize that for Paul the apostle to now minister of Jesus, the very one whose followers he was persecuting, there has been a radical change in his heart and life. And he begins to express the reason now in this one long sentence, as though he is so exuberant, so excited, so full of the grace of God, as though he just can't be stopped. There's not even room for a breath, hardly a comma. Now, I recognize that in our English translation Bibles, there are periods, right, to break this up into sentences that we can understand. But a number of you know that in the Greek, there are no periods. There, it's one long sentence as the Apostle Paul is just gushing, as it were, of the greatness of the glory and the grace of God. Now, having said all that, uh, it's not that there's no structure at all to his sentence, okay? I mean, there is some form of what he is saying. In fact, those who study this very well recognize that there is an unfolding structure of three things described as the sentence progresses. The first third of that long sentence, roughly verses 3 through 6, rotates around the subject of God the Father. Verses 7 through 10, can you guess? What will the next subject revolve around? If verses 3 through 6 is God the Father, what is verses 7 through 10 going to be about? The Son. And if you go on then from 11 through 14, what would it be about? The Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's important that you know that context. Now, I'm doing something a little unusual here. K.O. has said, even as I'm preaching, can I explain some of what I am doing? And uh, so he's already said, in expositional preaching, it's not just the text, but the context becomes very, very important to understanding what the text is about. And it's important that we remember that this long verse, this long sentence, also has subject context. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the reason we need to say that is because the first subject that's addressed in the Father section is one of the most controversial subjects in all the Bible. Okay? For those of you who've read ahead, you know you're about to enter the main event, right? What are we going to talk about? Predestination, right? No controversy in the church about that. No, you and I know that this is something the church struggles with, but we cannot deal with it if we don't recognize the context. Now, I will tell you, if you're an experienced Christian leader, if you know the Bible, you've already got strong opinions about this subject. I'm probably not going to change your mind this morning, okay? But I do need to give you some of my own background. So just, just a keyword so that you know I'm kind of familiar with the spectrum of opinion. I mentioned last night... I was raised by faithful Christian parents. My father was a lay minister in what the States is known as the Primitive Baptist Church. Now, Primitive Baptists are, by theology, what is known as hyper-Calvinist. In the United States, even known as 
anti-missionary Baptist, okay? Which means what? God is sovereign. God can save you. Don't be so arrogant as to think you should minister to people. <laughs> God can save who he wants to save. That's known as hyper-Calvinism. You don't even need missionaries. God will just do what he chooses to do. Now, that was my father. My mother, on the other hand, was free Methodist. <laughs> now, if <laughs> primitive Baptists are hyper-Calvinist, free Methodists are hyper-Arminian. <laughs> So, ultimately, at some point, when I wanted to preach the gospel, I went to seminary. And one of my primary goals was to figure out whether my mother or father was right. <laughs> Which probably is why I stayed at Covenant Seminary for 30 years. <laughs> and I'm still not going to tell you that I have it all figured out. But I will tell you what I think is important to know. We will not discuss the subject reasonably or well if we don't remember the context in which it is introduced. And I'll say it again. When Paul discusses the subject of predestination, he does it in the context of the fatherhood of God. And if we don't remember that, we will get in a debate about things the apostle is not concerned about. He is concerned about how the fatherhood of God affects the confidence of the Ephesians. Remember who they are? Christians in little bitty house churches, in a great and evil city in the ancient world. They are from different races, different ethnicities, different faith backgrounds. They are new to the faith. It's primarily a Gentile church. They surely must wonder if God has a plan and purpose for their lives and if they mess up, whether or not the Father will still love them. And so Father God is reminding them, I have loved you with an everlasting love. It is out of the fatherhood of God that he is preaching. Now, I'm not just making that up. It's important that you know in the great theological debates between the Reformed and the Arminian, John Calvin always gets, you know, kind of the, the mark of either pride <laughs> or blame, depending on where you are in that spectrum. But even John Calvin said this, if you discuss predestination outside the fatherhood of God, you will only do mischief in the church. It's important that you hear that. If you discuss this subject outside of its context, the fatherhood of God and what Paul is communicating to the early church then you will do mischief instead of help. Now, a lot of background. Let's read the text. Ephesians 1, and I'll only be reading verses 3 through 6. Paul the Apostle writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we recognize that this is a subject that has blessed and troubled Christians for centuries. And we approach it this day trying to do honor to your word. For it is your word that would be the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. We would not be guided by our opinions nor even by our traditions, but we would pray that we would be subject to and guided by your word. Teach us what you would say, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So again, just a little preview of where I'm going. Some questions that may uh, help us. Number one, you've read in this long sentence that we have God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit presented. So here's my question. Is God one or is God three? What's the answer, Bob? Yes. yes. 
You tell me the context of your question, and I'll tell you the answer, right? All right. Is light particles or waves? You tell me the context of your experiment, and I'll tell you the right answer. Is Jesus human or divine? You tell me the context of your question, and I'll give you the answer, because the answer is yes. Is water a liquid, a solid, or a gas? The answer is, you tell me the context. You tell me how cold it is, and I'll give you the answer. Context will determine the answer. Is God responsible for your salvation, or are you responsible for your salvation? The answer is, you tell me the context, and I'll tell you the answer. Because we begin to recognize, like almost all great biblical truths, there is a movement of a divine God beyond earthly wisdom in which we bow in humility before God and we say, I will not reject any of your word, but there are aspects of it that may be beyond human logic, not beyond human submission, but beyond human logic. If there were no mystery to God, God would not be God. If there were no mystery to God, God would not be God. And so the Apostle Paul, the one who wrote these words, actually, remember, at the end of Romans 11, praises God for the glory and the wisdom that is beyond our understanding. Now, the fact that it's beyond the understanding of our logic does not mean that our hearts cannot connect with what the apostle is trying to tell us about the fatherhood of God. Uh, as a father, let me tell you that when my oldest son was graduating from high school and preparing for university, he had a great privilege. My son was a very fine wrestler in the sport of wrestling. In fact, he qualified for the state tournament, so for our very large space, state, it meant for thousands and thousands of young people, he qualified as a finalist in the state tournament to wrestle for the championship of our part of the country, which is a very great privilege. But here was the problem. The date of the wrestling championship for the state was the same date that my son had to be in another state to qualify for a scholarship for the university that he wanted to attend. And the university was very clear. If you are not here on this date, you cannot qualify for the scholarship. There was competition. Others were showing up at that date. You had to be there on that date. Now, you can imagine the quandary that I, as a father, am in. I cannot say to my son, you can't wrestle for the state championship because we want the money for that scholarship. <laughs> you know, it was th this great conflict, you know, in us. Do we, do we let him go to wrestling championship, which he's for years trained to do, or do we send him to the university to earn the scholarship to save us some money? Well, as much as there was a quandary in us, it was also a quandary of what do you pray for? So here's what we ultimately determined. We would let our son go to the wrestling championship. And if he went and advanced very far in the rounds, we would just have to forego the scholarship. But if he did not advance very far, we would get in the car and drive as fast as we could to the scholarship con competition. Now, now it really gets to be hard to know what to pray for. Do I pray for my son to lose? <laughs> I will tell you, when your child is in the arena and there are tens of thousands of people around and he is wrestling against a well-muscled opponent and you, his father, are watching him, there is no question what you do. You say, Get him, Colin! <laughs> you know, squeeze him! Squash him! Crush him! <laughs> and then when your child gets in trouble, you say, I'm for you! Listen to me! I love you! <laughs> you know? 
You are bringing every emotion, every piece of you into the equation to say, I am for you. I love you. I've always loved you. I'm for you. Fight. Now, here are the Ephesians, this little bitty bunch of house churches in this major city, the church wondering, are we going to survive? And what happens if the paganism that has gripped our hearts reaches out to us again? What if we face oppression? What then? And the apostle says to the Ephesians, God, your father is for you. He loves you. He's always loved you. So that they will have confidence to continue in the face of great opposition. This is written in the context of a father God to children at great peril. And you have to understand that to understand the purpose. As you understand the purpose, you just have to ask the question, how are Christians to be assured of an eternal fatherly love? How are Christians to be assured of an eternal fatherly love? First, by assuring us that we have the blessings of a child of that father. Absolute assurance that we have the blessings of a child of a father. How do we know that? Verse 3, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Now, I mentioned last night that that phrase, in Christ, that we are united to Christ by the grace of God is Paul's most common expression of the gospel throughout his epistles. That by the work of God the Father, we are in, united to Christ. 200 times in the epistles, the Paul will one way, shape, or form talk about our union with Christ. In this one sentence, he mentions it 12 times. I mean, this is an important concept that, that you have the Father's love because you are united to his Son. You are in him, his character, his righteousness, his status is yours so that you would be adopted as a son as much as a child of God as Christ himself is because you are united to Christ. You need to know that. Well, if you are united to Christ, if you are in him, what is the significance of that? The significance is understanding if you are united to Christ, who is he and where is he? Same chapter, Paul will continue his thought, but just to remind you where this Christ is and who he is, verse 21, he is far above all rule and authority at the right hand of God above power and dominion, above every name that is a name, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And God put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Where is this Christ to whom you are united? He is seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. That's where he is. At the same time, he is above all powers, earthly and heavenly. He is the one who has absolute status above all things. He is at the right hand of God, the position of favor and love. Not only is he above all, he is beyond time. He is the ruler of this age and the ages to come. And he is over all things filling the church which is itself to be all in all, the expression of his power that will fill the whole earth in his time and purpose. The apostle has said, even as Christ is in the position of favor and love, so secure in the heavenly Father's heart that he is already in the heavenly places, you who are united to Christ can be assured that you have that love and you have that position, and you have that status, and you have that favor. This is yours. If you can think of, of every expression of the love and power that is in Christ Jesus, he who created the world and continues to sustain it by the word of his power and yet bought us with his own precious blood, the beauty of every sunset, the power of any storm, 
the wonder of love's passion, the beauty of a child's prayer, the hope of eternal glory, all that is in Christ Jesus and for those who are united to him, it is our same glory. Despite our sin, despite our weakness, despite our earthliness, this is already ours. Which means we are not just blessed in Christ, united to him with the status of a child of God. We are already blessed in heaven. We already have heaven's blessings and status granted to us. It's important that as you read verse 3, you recognize it's in the past tense when it talks about our heavenly status. That the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, has blessed us. This is an accomplished fact, has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We think of heaven as only being something in our future. But many of you know by the time you get to chapter 2 here in verse 6, Paul will say we are already seated in heavenly places. Now, it's not because that reality, as it were, we have the full experience of. But because we are united to Christ who is in heavenly places, there is an already reality of our status with God, our heavenly stature, status, and place, even though we're not yet there. And knowing that I have security with Christ in heaven is meant to give me a blessing of security even now, though I'm not there yet. How does that work? That I recognize I'm favored by God as loved as Christ and robed in his righteousness by faith in him. The righteousness, goodness, status, stature, and place of Jesus is already mine. Despite my weakness, frailty, and earthly existence. How can I already have blessing from something that hasn't happened yet? My family, for many years when my children were small, we always went on vacations to the same place. We went to a a cabin in the midst of a deep set of woods because my life is a lot of conferencing and a lot of people, a lot of fundraising, a lot of meeting people. I just want to get away. And so we go to our cabin in the forest, in the woods. And one day, it was late in the afternoon, and I asked my children, would you like to go on a hike with me? And so we went on the paths through the woods, and we went far away from our cabin, and at some point, recognized it was getting near dark, but we were a long way from the cabin. And so I said to my children, just follow me. And instead of following the path back through the woods, I went directly through the woods to where I thought the cabin would be. And we walked, and we walked, (laughs) and we walked. And I knew at some point I was going to have to turn around and say, we're lost. And I just about lost hope. And I turned around to tell my children, we're lost. And just as I turned around, I saw the light of our cabin. Now, we weren't there yet. But I was already at peace. (laughs) We weren't there yet, but in another sense, we were already home. The benefits, the blessings, the wonder, the assurance of that home provision was ours, though we were still in the woods. And Paul the Apostle is speaking to those who are at Ephesus. Despite their weakness, their frailty, their opposition, the the fragility of their church. And he is saying, I want you to know you're with Christ. And he's already in the heavenly places. And therefore, you can know in all of your struggles and all of your difficulties that you can be at peace because you're with him. I think of what that means for the people in our church. The ones who are sure that because of their sin, God is gone. Because of the crisis that presently is in their life, God must have departed. Because they cannot make earthly sense of the crisis or the trial that they are facing. That their faith is vain. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is, no, heaven is yours. You're already seated in heavenly places. There may be a trial now. 
There may be a difficulty. There may even be sin now. But you're united to Christ. And because you are united to Christ, you have the blessings of a child of God of which you can be sure. These blessings are not only the blessings of being a child of God, it's having the status of a child of God. We have his blessings. We also have his status. Verse 4 says, even as he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. When did God say that we would be holy and blameless before him? Before the foundation of the world. Now, we struggle with that. Part of the reason that we struggle is because of our humanity. And we struggle with the understanding that that time is as space to God, right? If, if we want to get from one place to another place, we take out our map and we say from here to there, that's what I want to do. But you must recognize that before God, who knows all things from all time, time itself is as a map before God. He sees, what does the Bible say? The end from the beginning. He knows the end from the beginning. It's, it's all rolled out before him as a, as a great map. He, he sees it all. And in that, we are told that he predestined us to be adopted as sons. But, but this love, which would be enabling us to be holy and blameless before him, was being expressed before the foundation of the world. Now, there is something about fathering that does begin to make some sense of that, even though our minds struggle with the logic Here's, here's the question I would ask those of you who are fathers, but mothers will know the answer too. When did you start loving your child? When he was 5 or 35? No, that's not when you started loving your child. When did you start loving your child? You started loving your child when your child was on the way. Now, if you as an earthly parent... Begin to love your child even before your child is born. Think about God, the perfect parent. When does he start to love? Well, before the foundation of the world. How did he express that love? You know, Revelation 13, Christ was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. He was understanding us, knowing us, and providing for us. Psalm 139, verse 16, tells us plainly, God wrote in his book all the days ordained for us before one of them came to be. Now, I don't understand all of that. I, my human comprehension can't exactly claim how it is that God knows and loves and provides and designs my life even before time began, according to Titus, verse 1. Excuse me, chapter 1 and verse 2. But there is a beauty that we all understand of being loved before we deserve it. Of being claimed before we earn it. Of being loved while still in the womb. Not when we've pleased our parents a certain amount. We, we understand the beauty of all of that great love. So if you think about what has been said here, it's not just that God loves us blindly. He has loved us in a very particular way. He has provided for us before the foundation of the world, into verse 4, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now this is a, a unique expression of the gospel for the Apostle Paul that occurs in various places. And what it is, as it were, is, is both sides of the gospel. When we, by faith, are united to Jesus Christ, something is taken away, but something is added to. Often in our Christian circles, we only think about half of the gospel. That is, I put my faith in Jesus Christ, that what that baptism signifies is my sin is washed away. My blame is taken away as far as the east is from the west. That is all wonderful and good truth, but it's not the end of the story nor the end of the gospel. It is true that we are made blameless, that our debt is taken away and canceled. But just if you do the accounting right, if you have a, a debt of $10 billion and your debt is canceled, how much money do you now have? Zero. What's the other side of the gospel? We don't just have our blame taken away. We are made what? Holy, 
righteous. The righteousness of Christ is added to us because we've gotten good enough? No. No matter what you do, your best works are filthy rags to God. Or Luke 17, 10, when we have done all that we should do, we are still unworthy servants. The righteousness that we have is not our righteousness. Whose righteousness is it? It is the righteousness of Christ. We are united to him. We are in him. Remember the analogy last night? It's like those Russian nesting dolls, right? One inside another, inside another. But the the one I am inside of is Christ. So that not only has he taken my sin away, he has clothed me with his righteousness, with his glory, with his goodness. Which means I stand before God with the favor of a child of God because my status is the same as the status of Jesus Christ. God has applied to me the holiness and And the amazing thing about verse 4 is this blamelessness, this taking away of sin, and this application of the righteousness of Christ is something that God is doing before the foundation of the world. Now, we're ready for all the debates. And I'd rather have you just think, not now as a father, but as a child. What does it mean to you to recognize that Before God knew the worst about you, he would love you and provide for you to be holy and blameless before him. Christian leader Lyle Dorsett describes his conversion this way. This is what he says. During the first six years of my marriage, I taught full-time published research, promotions came quickly, acclaim, grants, but despite the blessings of a loving wife, two children, and professional success, no rest came to my soul. To fill the void, I began to drink, and to drink heavily. One evening, my wife asked me not to drink anymore around the children. I stamped out. I went to a bar. I drank. At closing time, I went to a store and bought a six-pack so that I could drink some more. I left, drove up a winding mountain road, stopped at an overlook and I blacked out. The next morning, I found myself on a dirt road next to a cemetery at the base of the mountain. Somehow, I had gotten down without killing myself, and I had no recollection of how that had happened. Despite the hangover, I realized I had experienced a miracle. In desperation, I cried out, Lord, if you are there, please help me. As the years went by, I moved many times. I made many mistakes. But God gradually brought healing. He restored my marriage. He restored the years the locusts had eaten the years they had eaten out of my heart. The most humbling and reassuring lesson that I now recognize after three quarters of a century of walking with this Jesus is as I look backward in my life, I recognize his persistence in drawing me to himself, in loving me despite my sin and my weakness. Now I know that despite what I thought I was doing, God was always way out in front of me. Initiating life-giving knowledge of himself. Forgiving me when I strayed. Sustaining the relationships I would have broken. Even when I doubted, even when I deliberately moved away from him at times, he was still claiming me. It was all of grace. He was doing more than I could possibly have done for myself. Now, 
I know we are ready to theologically debate lots of pieces of that testimony, but here is what I'm absolutely certain. There is not a single one of us who will one day stand before the God of judgment in heaven and we should say, God, the reason you should let me in is because of what I did. Because of my choices, because of my goodness, because of what I have done. What will we all do? We will say, God, because of Jesus, his provision, his way, his claim, that is my only hope. Now, when we do that, we, we know that there are questions that come to my mind, but, but even as those questions come, if we're in humility before God, there is another attitude that takes over. It's, it's this educated scholar saying, I recognize God was out in front of me before the foundations of the world, loving, making a way, providing even the blood of his son. I heard it expressed one night in a church service, not by a scholar, but by a man who also struggled with alcohol in and out of prison until the Lord claimed him wonderfully. Now, as the Lord was claiming him, he, he didn't have all of his theology straight yet, which means, among other things, he didn't have all of his language straight yet. So he stood up in our church service one night to give testimony. And uh, I'm going to have to clean up what he said. Because he said, it's a darn good thing that God saved me because I was going to hell. Now, that's pretty simple. It's a pretty good thing that God saved me because in what I was doing, I was going to hell. And just in the simplicity of his expression, he was saying, God had to do something in my behalf. God had to turn me around. God had to do what he did to Paul. Paul is going toward Damascus. He's breathing out threats. He's already a murderer of Christians, and God just turned him around. Now, in Malaysia, you don't have ice, I know, on your roads very often. Do you ever have ice on your roads? No, you don't know what that's about. In my part of the country, you get ice on your road. And I can remember after one very severe snowstorm, it was a Sunday. I'm the preacher. I still got to go to church, right? And, and so I got all my little children in the car at the time and my wife, and we're heading toward church on this icy road. And, and, and we are going north toward the church. We hit a patch of ice, and suddenly we are going south, away from church. And my wife said, what did you do? And I said, I did not do a thing. <laughs> but suddenly I'm going a different direction. There are forces greater than me at work. Certainly what the Lord is saying to us through the Apostle Paul, who knew what it meant to go one direction and then be going the other direction, by the hand and the mercy and the power of God, was that before the foundation of the world, we were made holy and blameless before him. How did he do that? Verse 5, in love, ah, here's the hard word, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of of his glorious grace. What is Paul saying to us? Not only do we have the blessings of a child of the Father, not only do we have the status of a child of the Father, we have the Father. I mean, that's part of our assurance. We have the Father. Now, what does it mean to have God as your Father? Okay, I'm just going to go after the hard questions, and I won't solve them all for you today, okay? But does that mean that if God predestines us to be his children, that we're just puppets on a string, right? That, that we're just all Pinocchio, right? That God is saying, all right, love me, say you love me. I love you. Okay, now you're mine. Does, does predestination, God predetermines, God destines us ahead of time before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, to be adopted as sons in the beloved, to be united to Christ. Does that mean there's no responsibility on us, that we're just puppets? It cannot mean that. Not just because we're looking at this one long sentence. I want you to remember the context of the rest of the book of Ephesians. By the time you get over to chapter 4, just as an example... Verse 1, the apostle says, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling to which you have been called. When were you called? Before the foundation of the world. I urge you to walk worthy. Well, why would you urge anybody to do anything if they're just puppets? That wouldn't make sense. There's some 
mystery here, isn't there? That we understand this, this great assurance of the prevenient before salvation, before creation, this, this love of God that is at work in behalf of his people, uniting those that he intends to Christ for his purpose and the glory of his grace. And yet at the same time, he is saying to those same people, I have some expectations of you. You're not just puppets on a string. Verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4, you are to express humility and patience and forgiveness, bearing one another in love. You're to maintain unity. And yet having given all that instruction for what we are to do, verse 6 of the same chapter, he says, knowing that God is over all, through all, and in you all. At the same moment that he is giving human responsibility, he concludes by describing divine sovereignty over, in, and through all. Understanding that people cannot do what they're called to do if they are not dependent upon that particular God. I Listen, I've been a seminary president for 20 years. I've taught in academic institutions for more than 30 years. I've been in seminaries all over the world. If you want me to engage in a logical debate about sovereignty and responsibility, Arminianism and reform, I will tell you, I can quote the verses, I can give you analogies and illustrations you've never heard of. (laughs) But what I begin to recognize is God is speaking to both sides of our need. Okay? He, he is speaking to us and saying, if you think that you are secure because of your ability, your decision, your strength, you will be insecure. You have to know your dependence is upon the God who loves you and called you before the creation of the world. And, and, and he loved you before you were even born. Now, if you then say, oh, well, I'm just a puppet on a string, so it doesn't matter what I do, I will say, then you will not know that love of God. Because he is meaning you to respond to that love in the way that you are living, knowing that his sovereign, caring hand is working in and through and for you in every step of the way. Now, again, I don't know if you do this in Malaysia. One of the things that I most love to do, just just for my hobby, is I'm a fisherman. And in our part of the country, there are these fast-flowing, clear-water streams And what I love doing is getting in my kayak. Anybody know what a kayak is? Okay, good. (laughs) My canoe, my kayak, and getting on the clear water streams and fishing. Now, listen, when you're you're fishing, right? Sometimes when you're fishing, you, you are going down with the water. But sometimes the water turns you sideways. Sometimes the water turns you backwards. And you're going this way and that way and different ways and so forth, trying to get to where the fish are and fishing. And sometimes the water's even pushing you where you don't mean to go. But I'll tell you something, no matter going forward, backward, no matter how you're going, the stream is carrying you where it wants to go. And so God is saying to us, as we are going in this canoe of life, kayaking through our lives, I am calling you to humility and to obedience and faithfulness to serve me with the energy that I have given. But at the same time, we are being assured, assured God, who began the stream, is also taking us to where he wants to go. That, that those matters are operative at the same time. The great example to me is the life of Christ itself. I mean, I want you to remember Jesus on trial before Pilate. Do you remember what Pilate says when Jesus won't answer? Don't you know that I have authority to release you or crucify you? Do you remember Jesus' response? This is John 19, 11. You would have no authority over me unless it had been granted to you from above. He was the lamb slain before the creation of the world. You know from Isaiah, whose will was it to crush him? Whose will was it to crush the Son. Whose will was that? It was the Father's will. And yet Pilate is still accountable and responsible for the murder of the Savior. We recognize that. It is a letter that, Paul's letter, it is a book that is full of human responsibility. Even as we are fulfilling our responsibility, the scriptures are assuring us of the prevenient and even predestinating love of God that we do not fully understand in our logical minds. But I understand a father who holds me when I fall and loved me before I earned it. That I understand. 
And so this fatherhood of God is being put before us in a letter that is clear, not just about responsibilities. It is clear about relationships. He predestined us for adoption as sons. It is no glory to God if the only people who obey him are the ones that he absolutely controls. It is no glory to God if the ones who love him are the ones who have no responsibility to love him. They're forced to do whatever they do. I mean, even, I know some of you are Presbyterian in background, some of you Anglican. I mean, even, even the Westminster Confession, when it tries to deal with this hard subject of divine responsibility and human free will, you know, it, it ultimately gets to the point of describing of Adam, you say, how does this work? That Adam himself was left to the freedom of his own will. Well, how does that work if Adam is controlled by God and God is sovereign? And then the Westminster divines, when they talk about the predestination of God, say, and yet he operates so as to do no violence to the will of the creature. Wait, you just talked about sovereignty. How can God act to do no violence to the will of the creature? I don't know. That's not the point that Paul is addressing here. His point here is not to explain human responsibility versus God's sovereignty. His point is to give little frail humans assurance when they fall. He's talking in the context of the fatherhood of God. And in that sense, his letter is being made clear about relationships. My part of the country, there's a very famous musician, and some of you may know it because it was a Western song that went across the world for a while that was called Longer Than by Dan Fogelberg. And the words of Dan Fogelberg were, longer than there have been fishes in the ocean, higher than any bird ever flew, longer than there have been stars up in the heaven, I've been in love with you. Now, it was a love song to a girl. <laughs> but if you could just let it be theological for a moment. <laughs> longer than there have been fishes in the ocean before the foundations of the world, higher than any bird ever flew, already settled in heavenly places. Longer than there have been stars up in the heaven, before time began, I've been in love with you. Now, if Father God were to say that to you, wouldn't that help you on the days of your distress and despair and hurt? It would. And that is the purpose here. God is ultimately saying, you're not to be a fatalist. You're to know that you are blessed in the beloved. As much as God loves Jesus, if you are united to him, your blessings are his. Well, why did he choose you? Well, because you're better than other people. Why did he choose Israel? Why did he choose Israel? Because they're the dinkiest, smallest, and most obnoxious of people. So that his grace would be on display. Why did he choose you? In verse 5, according to the purpose of his own will, to the praise of his glorious grace. If we ever say that the Father loves me, we need to quickly add, and that's not because of me. <laughs> it's because of him. In fact, his grace is on display when he came to people as messed up as the Apostle Paul and as messed up as David and as messed up as Abraham and as messed up as me and as messed up as you. That is to the praise of his glorious grace. Why does he do that? Hey, listen, that's not the subject here. The subject is not why. That's not the context. The context is, what is the expression of his love? It is the love of a father for those who need to know it despite what happens. Okay, you want to know what happened to my son? He did go to the state championship. He did not make it very far. So we got in the car, and we drove to the university to compete for the scholarship. And he got the scholarship. <laughs> now, as we were driving home, 
my son, who was feeling a little bit better about losing the wrestling match because he'd gotten the scholarship, he was just talking to me and he said, Dad, you know, he said, it's amazing. It's kind of like God had the whole thing planned. <laughs> oh, you think? <laughs> We wrestle and fight and wonder. And what is God saying to his children? I got you. From the beginning of the world, I loved you. And I'll hold you and I'll keep you because my love even goes beyond this world to heaven itself. You're already secure in Christ, already seated in heavenly places. Because after all, what I want you to know, says the Father, is longer than there have been fishes in the ocean, higher than any bird ever flew, longer than there have been stars up in the heaven. I've been in love with you. That's the word of a father. And that I understand. I understand that kind of love from my father in heaven. Father, there are very uh, sharp and able men and women here today from different traditions, different backgrounds, and I suspect I've not said anything that they've not heard before. But what you do in your word, particularly this portion, is you are meaning to assure the hearts of people who are frail and weak and questioning and doubting, if not because of you, because of their own weaknesses and their own crises and the world that presses in on them and the sin that makes them doubt your affection. So take your word as you intended it. And remind us what it means to be loved by a heavenly and eternal Father who knows time of the end, even from the beginning, so that we will take our rest in you and by being so well rested, be strong for Jesus. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.